In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Uh, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love, for your care, for everything you did and still doing for us. Lord, give us the power and strength to do your will. Bless our Bible study. Bless everyone who is here who is in this meeting. Make all our days full of hope, good news, peace, and love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Through the intercession of May, and always saints and martyrs who please you from the beginning, the mighty powerful love given cross, and the blessings of the days of St. Mary's fast, please Lord, make us ready to pray thankfully. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. <clears throat> Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus, our Lord, for thou is the kingdom, power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> All righty. Um, <clears throat> well, we have Munir and Mariam too. It's good to have you guys with us. So real quick, we'll do a quick review. You, everybody knows what we're going to do. Let's just do it. Okay. So I will talk about last time we covered in chapter 43 from 22 to the end. And some of the main points we talked about, first of all, we were recalling from earlier in the chapter how um, God is showing the people and he's showing us four things, that he is our creator, our redeemer, our savior, and our sanctifier, okay? And we said, we noticed an interesting difference is that the first two, you know, creating you and redeeming you, <clears throat> Uh, what can everybody see the 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 Isaiah forty four the Coptic reader? Yes, it's your boy. I just something popped on the screen. Not sure what. Sorry. So so creating you and redeeming you are done by God alone, and you have no say in them. He just did it for you out of His love for you. You were not even there to like, uh, any ask for it or want or whatever. But then the other two, saving you and sanctifying you, they are also done by God, but you do have a part in them. And they actually cannot happen without your participation, uh, without your co-laboring with God. <clears throat> After believing and being baptized, repentance is what will lead me to salvation. We were talking about that question last time. Um, the salvation that is offered freely by God, but repentance is a must that I need to do. A person who believes and is baptized, but does not remain in this belief and does not remain in honoring this baptism, we talked a lot about the water, through repentance will not be saved. <clears throat> this is our faith with all due respect to any some other younger Christian denominations. Um, also, we saw from uh, chapter 43 that other than repentance or uh, along with repentance, uh, there's also another responsibility on me that I need to do, which is to co-labor with God in my sanctification. A lot of us just sit there and wait for God to do this um, and just pray for it. And God, sanctify me, make me righteous, make me Christ-like, make me holy, and don't do diddly. And they think that God will magically do this. You know, I'll share with you something I didn't mention last time. Um, I'm going through the book, Beginning to Pray by Anthony Boom. Phenomenal book. Strongly recommend it. Um, and in it, he said that every time you pray and ask God for something, in your prayer, you are promising God to something. In your request, you are promising God to something. For example, if I pray to God and ask him um, to sanctify me, I have a part to do with this. I'm telling him I'm going to co-labor with you and sanctify me. If I'm asking God to help me to forgive, I need to work on it. If I'm asking God to help me to be patient, I need to practice different things to help me be patient. Um, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> And again, this is if we're praying for the things we ought to be praying for, which are the heavenly kingdom, right? 
the, the other stuff like, you know, God get me this job. Actually, even that I have a part to do in it, which is to work hard, to study, to take a course or a certification or seek out the job instead of just sit there on my couch waiting for it to fall in my lap. <clears throat> okay. And then we said, what? After creating me and redeeming me, my part is to partner up with God and co-labor with God. Remember that term St. Paul used it, a co-laborer with God by my living my life in continuous repentance and continuous um, sanctification. Uh, one observation we made is that how it is mind-boggling that so many people choose physical rest or entertainment or earthly living or money over God. Because we, talk, we talked a lot about how the, 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 what we get when we are with God. And even more mind-boggling is that so many people choose self-destructive choices over God. And then we said, God created me for his glory and for my eternal joy and eternal benefit and living life to the fullest and keeping rejecting. And, and then we keep rejecting him. It just doesn't make any sense. And then we got to the part where God says, you have brought me uh, no sheep or didn't honor me with sacrifices and so on. And we said that, there are two ways to do this. Some people do this by actually physically not bringing any offerings. But th there are some offerings that are offered, but in God's eyes, it's as if nothing was offered. You remember some of those? We talked about when we offer the lame and the rejected and the blemished, when we offer our leftovers instead of our first fruits. Um, when we offer for selfish purposes to be seen by men, you know, so we get our reward, like God said in the gospel before the great fast. So, but in God's eyes, we didn't offer anything. Uh, or when we offer like just as a routine or begrudgingly or without heart, without love, he wants our heart more than our offerings, you know, right? He said, my child, give me your heart. And then we asked an important question, which is, why do you think God wants us to worship him? Probably a question we never thought about. <laughs> you know, why does God want us to worship him and to worship him genuinely and truly with our heart? And we said the answer is the same answer that the same reason that God's command, God gave us his, uh, his commandments for us or the same reason for anything that God does because it's good for us because when it comes to true, genuine worship, because through that, he wants us to slow down, to have a day of Sabbath, a day of rest, to unplug, and how ridiculously needed that is today, to disconnect and to take our mind off the world and all the worldly things which are passing away. Um, and also because it is in our sincere, heartfelt, genuine worship that we are filled that we are healed, that we are strengthened and rejuvenated and sanctified. It is good for us to worship God genuinely and wholeheartedly. <clears throat> That's why he wants us to worship. And also, um, one of you, I think, mentioned a great observation. I think it was Mary. She said that we are created to worship. So if we don't worship him, we will end up worshiping something else, other gods. So... Might as well worship the one that is worthy, who is worthy of worship. Um, and then we saw that that we started to you know notice that especially in the last since uh, chapter what was it thirty seven, um, how it's God does a lot of good for the people, and then the people <laughs> repay him by rejecting him or betraying him. And yet God does them even more good. And then they reciprocate that with keeping rejecting them and betraying them. And then he does them even more and more good. And, and we were just overwhelmed by how infinite and unsearchable his love is for us. It is just doesn't make sense. Um, and then we got to that verse. Uh, what verse was it? 25 in, in chapter 43. I even I, and he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. And we talked about how 
it's a wonderful verse and like it'd be great for us to like hang it on the walls in our homes uh or so that every time we sin or fall short and every time we betray him again we are quick to get up again and to return to him and to offer sincere repentance and to keep on walking in our journey with him whatever i have done or keep doing if i confess it and i ask him genuinely for my from my heart for forgiveness he will do it and he will blot it out and he will remember it no more when we talked for a minute a little bit about the act of blotting out a stain it's not removing the stain it's not erasing it it's it's transferring the stain placing it from, from one thing onto another um and that's to, to satisfy the divine justice. He's not going to trump his justice for his mercy. So when he blots out our transgressions and iniquities, he removes them from us and places them on himself. <clears throat> um, by the way, feel free to stop me if you have any questions or comments or anything. And then we said, like, what is the significance in us remembering and thinking about and contemplating on God not remembering our sins once we sincerely repented and asked for forgiveness and we said a bunch of stuff other than remembering that God doesn't hold the grudge or he will not act on it um, but we should be joyful along with our remorse for the sin we should be joyful we should honor this tremendous forgiveness by trying even harder next time find out the triggers, try a new way, think about it with my father confession, try to, we honor the gift by trying to work harder. And then we said, we should accept it as an undeserved gift and also forgive ourselves, which a lot of us have a hard time doing and feel too guilty to do that or are afraid to do that. Um, for understandable reasons, but we need to just accept God's forgiveness and also be able to forgive ourselves. And then also we said we should pay it forward. So we also should be like our father in heaven and we should try wholeheartedly to forgive those who sinned against us, whether they deserve it or not. And uh, we may not forget their sin against us like he does, but from experience, if we do forgive genuinely, it may take a long time, but eventually it will be forgotten. And then we said something interesting that, yeah, we kind of need to remember our sins, but our remembrance of our sins should be only for the purpose of keeping us humble and reminding us that, yeah, I'm, I'm fully capable of making a mess of things, but not for self-beating, self-loathing or faint-heartedness. This is faint-heartedness. This is not what God wants. This is what the enemy wants so that we don't get up and we, we stay in the mud. So that we don't say, Micah 7, 8, uh, do not gloat over me, O my enemy, though I fall, I will rise again. Though I walk in darkness, God will be my light. <clears throat> and then we got to, in, in verse 26, when, when God said, put me in remembrance, in remembrance, let us contend together. State your case that you may be acquitted. And, and we were amazed by it how humble God is and how open and wonderful God is and how wonderful it would be if we also do the same, to be this humble and open for a challenge and open for a discussion. Um, it'd be really a great thing. Um, this is especially pertinent for um, parents, especially dads. We don't tend to be very good uh, listeners to our kids sometimes or spouses and also for like people on authority at work managers bosses supervisors presidents and so on um and we talked about how there is one thing that you know we don't need to remind god of anything but there is one thing that we can remind god of with with favor with boldness like kind of daring which is to remind him of his promises his mercies and and that we are called by his name right he kept saying you are mine i called you by your name um that we are his and as he says in this lovely chapter 
And at the same time, we need to also remember that in reminding God of his promises, we also need to remind ourselves, or in that same promise, we are also reminding ourselves of the premises that came with those promises. We said the Bible has 7,000 promises, and each one of them has a premise. There is a part that is on me that I need to do. We can't just sit there and expect God's promises to come to fruition, as many people do. So to ask myself, am I fulfilling them? Or am I at least trying very hard to fulfill those premises? And then lastly, we talked about how the book of Isaiah, which I didn't really touch on before. I didn't really notice it before for as many times as I read it. The book of Isaiah, based on us going like deeply in it, right, like we are right now, it's not just merely a historical book telling about things or events or interactions that occurred between God and Israel or Israel and other people. And also, it's not just a prophetic book that tells us of many things to come, whether a couple hundred years after this or whether at, this, at the first coming or whether at the second coming at the end of the world. But the book of Isaiah is rather a revelation that shows us who God is and how God operates and it shows us that God is real that he is the only possible God we'll get more of that into chapter 44 today and then if you recall we ended it was with a question saying that based on our knowledge of God from the book of Isaiah so far is that we've seen how chapter 43 ended in, in a kind of a stern and rough way uh let me pull it up um yeah verse 28 uh well 27 28 he said your your first father sinned and your mediators have transgressed against me even their priests sinned. therefore i will profane the princes of the sanctuary the high priest i will give jacob to the curse and israel to reproaches that's how chapter 43 ended and then we said, based on our knowledge of how God is and who God is from the book of Isaiah, we said, how do you th think chapter 44 will begin after this stern rebuke or statement? Do you remember? How do you think chapter 44? Oops, never mind. <laughs> I need to hide this. <laughs> do you remember? You saw it. <laughs> okay i wasn't thinking but yeah we saw that in spite of all this god begins with yet which is like but you know like however like it's almost like all the stuff was like god venting and god warning and god trying to bring him back and then he he goes back to yet he now or jacob my servant um Okay, any questions or comments or anything before we start reading 44? I do. Go ahead, Mary. Um, so I need to clear up some confusion on my part. And so I don't know, my Arabic is not great, but the word ned is like when you pray and like you're praying to God, but in exchange doing something. Is that right? Yes, that right it, it means vow. Okay, so like when we pray to God, and we ask for something, we obviously need to also fulfill what we need to, like what God asks us to do. But the concept of Ned kind of makes me feel like it's an exchange. Like it doesn't seem, I don't understand. It seems wrong to me. I don't know why. Like, what am I missing here? In my personal opinion, not much. But before I answer, um, you're not missing much of anything I, I think you're right on but I, i'd love to hear from everybody else what do y'all think about the concept of making vows there, there is a way to use the vow but i think it's to be done in a better order but i want to hear from people in the group is a vow different from because we're not supposed to take an oath they i never thought about it before but they both sound like a serious promise yeah, a vow is a promise um, or, or an oath. Like we take oaths or, or make oaths uh, a lot, but kind of swearing is, you know, uh, per the Bible, we shouldn't swear because we can't change a hair and 
and our header will make ourselves like a little bit longer, which is very unfortunate for some of us. Um, but yeah, if, so if I vowed for something, Abuna, I should do it. Agreed. If I vow, I should fulfill that. That one is obvious because the Bible says it is better not to vow than to vow and, and not fulfill. Okay, so this we it's non negotiable, it's in the Bible. It is better not to vow than to vow and not fulfill. So if I make a vow, I better fulfill it. So I better think twice and thrice before making a vow. Actually, Abuna, I, uh, all, all my life, I always, uh, I, I, uh, I agree with Mary. I always find it difficult to understand the concept of vowing because it is as if I'm setting condition to God. If you do this to me, I will do this in church. I vowed only once in my life and I I did what I vowed beforehand. Before that was what... the point I was, thank you. That was the point I was going to tell Mary. Personally, I don't do vows. Uh, when I ask God first off, you know, we say according to your will, according to your timing. Um, but if a person feels, because vows are mentioned, um, in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, because there is a vow that like St. Paul did when he went and shaved his head and he had some guys with him in order to fulfill that vow. Um, but if I were to make a vow, I would, whatever it is, like, God, please do so and so. And if you do it, I will give this or I will fast that or I will do this or I will, whatever the vow is. I do it. Like I would pray and then I would fulfill the vow, the vow immediately. Whether God does what I'm hoping for or not. Um, this is if somebody really wants to make a vow. At the same time, even that's the yeah, kind of a little bit confused. But does anybody have more insight on vows? Uh, I have. Go ahead. On vows, I consider it as showing how grateful you are to God and fulfilling something that would uh, benefit God. Or for instance, if you're vowing to give an umbrella to a church, that would help the church. So you're just showing how grateful and thankful you are. It's not just like people agreements. You say like, if you do this, I'll do this. That's for people for motivation or something like that but with god i would consider it showing how thankful you are very well and so to look at it as an expression of gratitude mm -hmm. meaning something you do after god does something that you're hoping for sure no problems there there is actually many times in the old testament we read about the thanksgiving offerings or an offering of thanksgiving um, there's also vows Abuna, that both sides like what the person is asking from God at what, and what the person is promising to do both of them are spiritual like I know a story from uh, one person in our church who is a convert who was really taken very like close to this and he was not Christian and he vowed if, if God healed him he will read the Bible and try to to understand and then he 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 turned to to Christ afterward. So that's another vow that uh, could be more um, reasonable. That's right. Sure. So I guess it, so. Is it acceptable in certain cases? Like I just like for some reason I feel like it would be more of a just disappointment if you don't fulfill what you're and and it's also like if. I don't know how to explain it, but it's like, it doesn't seem sincere if you're making a bargain. It's like, if you give me this and I'll do this in exchange, I mean, you're supposed to do it anyway, right? Can I say something, Abuna? I, I agree with you, Mary, and, and my thoughts are the same exactly. And that's why I, I avoid personally, I'm speaking personally, I'm not saying it's wrong for anybody to do this because it is a part of, of the faith, but I personally don't do vows. Go ahead, uh, Mom. Uh, actually, when we ask Abuna something, God something to do it for us, 
Number one, we should offer the gift that we promised God. Because whatever we give him is much, much, is nothing compared to what he's doing us. Second so you're thing, saying to offer it bef- immediately when we ask, instead of yes. waiting until the prayer is, uh, okay. Yes. Second thing, if in my eyes it was not uh, fulfilled, this vow was not done, I'm sure God has something better for me. So I shouldn't يعني, tell him, why God, why didn't uh, do this to me or what I asked you to do? So anything I I promise, it's just very, very simple gift to show my love to him. If you consider it like that, okay. So um, we're, I don't know, perhaps it's something like Rafat mentioned, maybe it's for like... Uh, baby Christians or for non-believers. And I'm not to say that we are like adult or grown-up Christians or anything like that. I don't want to sound haughty, but um, perhaps there's nothing wrong with it, but there is a higher road, if you will. And for me, which is complete surrender to God, uh, to ask for his will and his timing and be thankful, you know, even before I utter the prayer, kind of like what he uh, what our Lord uh, did before raising Lazarus. Lazarus, he he thanked God. He said, "Father, I thank you for you hear me." And and, uh, and then he said, "Lazarus, come forth." So, really, that's how we should we should have that. I remember a little child one time I was in one of the camps and we were praying, and and he said, um, "Jesus, we thank you for everything you you gave us, and we thank you for everything you didn't give us." Um. That was really profound. Uh, Abuna? Go ahead. Uh, I also think, uh, I'm not sure if I'm right, I think it's kind of Old Testament thing. I, I know that New Testament is complementing the, the Old Testament, but it's like the tithes. The, uh, Jesus said, you, you, were, you were supposed to give the tithes, but I tell you, whoever has two tonics, let him give one to those who does not have so vows, you mentioned it's in the New Testament, but I think when Paul did that, you know, the early church, they were still going to synagogues and the church was just in a stage of transforming. Transitional, yeah. Transitional. So uh, because he shaved his head and stuff, this is not a, a Christian thing. It's He was still uh, doing the Jewish rituals when he did that, but uh, I don't find any trace of it in the New Testament. That's why I, my heart is never into the concept of. of, of uh, I agree. I agree. Uh, and and there are, you know, I'm I'm not a fan of people say, oh, that's Old Testament, you know, and and this New Testament. But there are some things that have have gone away with in the Old Testament that now they've been replaced by something higher, something better, not negated, but just replaced by something better. And I'm I'm afraid. I'm guessing, okay, I don't know this for a fact, but I hope that the whole concept of vowing and promising God, you know, I'm going to give X amount of money to the poor or whatever, if you do so and so, that I hope this is not something we learned from uh, other people, you know, living with us in Egypt for 14 centuries, um, which are also influenced by uh, Judaism. Um, not sure if other cultures do this or not, but uh, I think I think for the most part, at least those of us who spoke, we're on agreement about the concept of vowing. <laughs> um, <clears throat> exactly. Go ahead, Dr. Crown. Abuna, it works. I am doing it actually. If I will lose something, then uh, I will say I will vow to Ambawannas and immediately I will found it. So it is, uh, I think it is very good. To call on Ambawannas? Yes. To yes. help you or to make yes. a vow? Yes, yes, no, to found, to found what, I, what I lost. Okay, yeah, that's, no, that's different. That's asking for the intercession or the help of the saints. And that's different from making vows. Uh, um, thank you. Good question, Mary. 
All righty. Oh, let's uh, let's get started with chapter 44. And again, if anybody has any other questions or anything, just jump in. Let's read together from verse 1 through 5. Who I will wanna... read? Yes, it says Ramses. Go ahead. May I ask another question? Please. The word uh, redemption is uh, ransom was paid, right? Yes. Uh, you, you, one way to say is, is ransom that that needs to be paid or was paid. You can say also somebody taking somebody else's place um, is another way to say it. Uh, fide. Fide. So this is like uh, some people in jail and you pay for uh, ransom to be uh, released and some people leave, some people stay there for some reason. Sure. Uh, also, redemption for only believers or all humanity? <clears throat> The redemption was for all humanity, because we said, remember what there was a, a, a four things: creation and redemption. Those were done for all humanity, and without humanity's, without asking humanity, it was just given. Right? Jesus died for everybody to redeem everybody, but then uh, salvation and sanctification. That's it is also offered to everybody, but I need to co-labor with God to. To obtain those. Um, the price has been paid. It is finished for all humanity, from Adam to the last human being. But then there's salvation and sanctification that those uh, depend on us to take advantage of the redemption or not. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. All righty, verses one through five. Good questions, y'all. Uh, who will read? Guys. Okay, go ahead, uh, Eva. You need to uh, unmute. There you go. Yeah, here now. Oh, Jacob, my servant. And Israel, who I have chosen, then say the Lord, who made you and form you from the womb, who will help you? Fear not, O oh, Jacob, my servant, and you, Jesurim, who I have chosen. For I will put water in him who is thirsty and flood on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit in your descendants and my blessing on your offspring. They will spring up among the grass like willows by the water courses. One will say, I am the Lord. Another will call himself by the name of Jacob. Another will write with his hand the Lord and name himself by the name of Israel. Glory be to the Holy Trinity, our God, forever. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. Imagine this with me. Remember, again, the ending of chapter 43, shame and curse and reproach, right? Can you imagine the people standing before God? after the end of chapter 43, standing like, like a child caught with the hand in the cookie jar, like totally embarrassed, totally exposed, maybe even fearful, and has no answer to give. Just imagine that, okay? And then God instantly, instantly repeats the same lovely words again from the previous chapter, immediately in verse 1. He says, yet hear now, O Jacob, my servant. Yes, O Israel, you're still a big hot mess, but you are still my servant. You are still under my protection. I am responsible for you. I got you, as we've read in, in 42 and 43. And then he says, and Israel, whom I have chosen. Yeah, 
You ain't worth nothing, but I have chosen you. I still want you because my love for you is not conditional on whether you deserve it or not. And thank God for that. Um, <clears throat> then in verse two, he says, thus says the Lord who made you and formed you from the womb, who will help you. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, and you, Jethro, whom I have chosen. Which is more of the same stuff. Okay, I'm not going to spend too much time on it because we, we did last time. I made you. Uh, I formed you from the womb. This is a good verse, by the way, for those who say that a fetus inside the womb is not a human being yet. You know, when talking about abortion and stuff. Although I'm very thankful for the leaps and bounds that have been made in, in, with abortion lately. It says, I am the one who will help you. Don't be afraid because you are my servant again, whom I have chosen again. Do you, do you, like, are you soaking this in? Like, there's such trouble. And God is, has just said the words about shame and reproaches and, and all that stuff. And then he immediately says the stuff. Our God is, is, is a softy. I don't know how else to say it, but he's a softy. And it gets better. Look at how gentle and how loving God is who keeps reassuring his people. Yes, you deserve death and hell and reproach and shame and curse, but you are mine. I chose you already. I'm not going to change my mind. When I chose you, I knew what you're going to do right now. I know how you think. I know how you sin. I know how you falter. I know how blind you can be. But I, I chose you anyway. So I'm, I'm still there. God is above time. He's not going to change his mind. And he says, I will help you. I'm not giving up on you. My love for you is unconditional. And then check this out. He calls them Jeshrun or Yeshrun. Do you know what Yeshrun means? Straight. Jeshrun, yes. And, and not only that, Jeshrun is a poetic name that God sometimes calls Israel by. Is is derived, it's like a nickname, like Ismidala. You know, it's it's derived from the root word meaning upright or just or straight. So picture this. After all this, God is calling Israel by an endearing poetic name, but also the people, those same people who are crooked and never upright, God calls them by the nickname that means what? Straight and upright. <laughs> this doesn't make sense. Um, it's like somebody's being very harsh, and then God calls them, you are my kind child. Uh, kind of like uh, with, with Gideon, right? He was hiding and like, you know, threshing some weed in the one press deep down in the hole and uh, or the threshing floor. And, and like, you know, and God calls him, you know, greetings or, or you mighty man of valor. <laughs> God looks at us as, as how he created us to be and what we can be, not by how we really are uh, or how we deserve or how we are at that time. I don't know, maybe it'd be wonderful if, if we see ourselves like this, not from the sense of arrogance and pride, but from the sense of motivation and believing in, you know, I can do all things through Christ too. Um, anyway, sometimes I, I daydream and I wonder how my life would be if I loved others this unconditionally with the same unconditional love. I mean, wow, uh, it'll be really nice for me and for everybody around me. And this is how God repays them for their transgressions. Look at verse three. <coughs> he says, for I will, okay, you deserve reproaches and curse and, and shame and, and whatnot. And you'd think, therefore, dot, 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 right? One of the therefore verses. But then he goes, for I will pour water on him who is thirsty and floods on the dry ground. It's almost like he's rewarding them. I will pour my spirit on your descendants and my blessing on your offspring. This water that I'm going to pour on you will wash you and will change your nature. And speaking of water, I think it would be a, a good study to, to do one day. Maybe we can even do it in between Bible studies, like in between books. If we do a Bible study on, on water in the Bible and just go through from like, Genesis all the way through Revelation 
and and see what the Bible says about water. I think it'd be really interesting. But uh, verse three is a wonderful verse, stating out very clearly how water is a symbol of God's Holy Spirit. Okay, because he says, "I will pour out water on him. I will pour out my spirit." He's repeating it. Okay. Also, the word "pour," P-O-U-R, indicates what? Abundance. Generosity. God don't just give; He pours. Agreed. Um, any any other thoughts? Usually when you pour something, you pour something from what level to what level? Higher to lower. Yeah. Pouring indicates something from above. Okay, that's the first thing. The other thing also Pula Krafa said, it is, it is done in abundance, without measure, wholeheartedly. It's not like with a measuring cup or a teaspoon. It's like just pouring it, however much it is, wholeheartedly given. No take backs given freely and in abundance. And Isaiah prophesied about God pouring, pouring his Holy Spirit on his people many centuries before Pentecost. How cool is that? Okay. Also, <clears throat> pouring water on the arid, dry, parched land gives what? Life, gro growth, new, exactly. new growth. Life. I don't know if you've ever seen those. I love seeing those because they do it like in time lapse. But if you ever seen those documentaries, how they show us there's some arid and dry deserts on Earth, in different parts of the planet, that they get rain maybe once every few years. And how it's just desert. It's just sand and dry and, and, and of course. But then after a strong, heavy rain, it turns into like within a matter of like days, it turns into this gorgeous meadow, a land full of color and beauty and life and animals and insects and birds. And it's, it's amazing. Um, and he will not only pour his water and spirit on you, but what else from the verse? What do you see? Blessing. On? Oh, on your offspring? Yeah. So he's not just going to do this, pouring out his water and his spirit on you, but also on your offspring and on your descendants. And this is not just talking about physical descendants, but also on, on their children in the spirit. Okay, on like spiritual descendants. Speaking of pouring water, um, do you know what is the symbol or contemplation of Abuna throwing water on the people after liturgy? Is it a reminder of our baptism? Good guess, but no. <laughs> or the Catholic guess. I mean, water, right? So it makes sense. I think this is, yes. it might be uh, blessing you uh, with the Holy Spirit. Excellent. Very good. That's exactly what it is. Is it? I love it. Yes. <laughs> That's a good guess. So let me explain to you something. So throughout the whole liturgy, we go through the whole story. We go through creation. We go through the fall. We go through the prophets. Um, we go through incarnation. We go through crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension. If you pay attention, we go through the whole, every liturgy, we go through all of this stuff. But then there's something missing, which is what, as Eva said, Pentecost. We haven't, we haven't done that part yet because, yes, it is finished. It is accomplished. But there was yet one more thing left where the, the Lord told them, wait in Jerusalem, wait in the upper room until... I pour out my spirit on you, and then you can go out to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and all the earth. And so when Abuna sprinkles the water on the people, it's a reminder of Pentecost, on, 
uh, it's a symbol of the Holy Spirit falling upon the people. Uh, and again, it's just a, a contemplation, okay? So that, yalla, now you've lived the whole thing, and now the Holy Spirit, yeah, it's fall upon you. Now go, reach out, teach, baptize, and lo, I'm with you until the end of the age. Um, and we also do something referring to the second coming, because, you know, there's, there's still a part missing, right, from the whole story, since we're mentioning the whole story. But even that, we do it in the liturgy. Um, what is it? Let's do some uh, liturgical stuff here. See how much, how well you know your church. We look to the east. Okay. <laughs> Good guess. Um, but that, that's, that's true, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm an actual second coming happening. Bruno, what's the question again? Sorry, I... Uh... That, okay, that in the liturgy, we, we either talk about or commemorate or do an act or an action that symbolizes something throughout the whole story from creation until the second coming. And we talked about the sprinkling of the water at the end of the liturgy is a symbol of the Holy Spirit, Pentecost, and, and, and giving power by the Holy Spirit, and then to go out and to reach out to the world. But what about the second coming? I would have given the same answer, Miss did. <laughs> so there is a part where, sorry? Ahead, well, Kat. I think I tried this before, and I don't remember if I was told I was wrong or not. But I, when when um, when we're about to receive communion, and Abuna comes out, and we say, "Blessed is He who comes in the name of Excellent. the Lord," I was told we do it twice. The two comings of Christ. Ding, ding, ding! Give the lady oh, okay. seventy-five cents. Good job. Um, so one thing we do we do mention His second coming, awesome and full of glory. Abuna does say that the words we do recall it, but when Abuna turns, takes the, the body, which is smeared with the blood of Christ. So this is Christ, right? He turns to his left and he says, the holy is for the holy. And the people say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And then he goes back to the altar, which is heaven. And then he turns to the other side, to the right. And he says, uh, the holy body and precious blood of a man or God, this is true. Amen. And the people say, not Amen. <laughs> blessed is he who comes in the name of the lord this other turn is a symbol of the second coming so that the one the turn the first turn to the left is the first coming the incarnation blessed is he who comes in the name of the lord and then the second when he goes back he places the pattern on the altar for just a split second and then turns again to the other side and the people repeat the same phrase and it's a symbol of the second coming um it's very good and important to know why we do what we do and like what is a symbol of and what does it mean etc and i think it'll make the people in general fall in love and really enjoy and benefit from every part of the liturgy um and i think it's good to to know that stuff uh sorry i didn't mean to go off topic too much but we can go back and resume the bible study does anybody have any questions or anything about those the sprinkling of the water or the the when Abuna goes back, bring, it's not like he's playing games with you. I'm going to give you communion. No, I'm not. And then, okay, I'll give you communion. It's not what's happening. One of the kids said that one time. It's like Abuna's teasing. Um, okay. Verse four. He says, they will spring up. Now, after he poured this water on the dry land, they, the people, will spring up among the grass like willows by the water courses. Great analogy. Those of you who love uh, the willows, the weeping willows, typically, it's a kind of a big, huge tree that's very obvious. And typically, where do you see them? I know it's Missy's uh, favorite tree, so she should know. <laughs> Occasionally, we see them in neighborhoods and houses and stuff like that. But typically, you see a, weep a weeping willow or a willow by the edge of by the, the water banks yes by the waters by the edge of a lake or the edge of a river and so on they usually need a lot of water 
um, continuous water, if you will. So it's, it's further indication of that pouring, of the abundance of the pouring of this water and the spirit uh, on the people. Then verse 5, it says, One will say, I am the Lord's. Another, this is as a result or after the pouring of the water. One will say, I am the Lord's. Another will call himself by the name of Jacob. Another will write with his hand, the Lord's. It's like his title. It's like a tattoo almost. And, but not, not, not a tattoo. And name himself by the name of Israel. So as God pours out his water and his spirit, the recipients of this, which are the believers, water and spirit, right? Will say, just like the Shurmite woman in the Song of Songs, I am my beloved's. And he is mine. I am the Lord's. Um, and when it talks about others who will be named by Jacob or by Israel, it's referring to other Gentile nations who will join the Jews to be God's children. And that's exactly what happened. A lot of the new Christians in the first century were, were not Jews. Some of them were Jews who said, I am the Lord's. And some of them were Gentiles who joined in. And that's why they had the problem about Judaizing them. And they had the first Jerusalem of council. Um, and this is exactly why we are called Christians, because we are called by the name of Christ. What an honor, the name above all names. As a matter of fact, um, a lot of the silent prayers, this is another little part about the liturgy. I don't know why we're going there a lot today, but another part of the, if you, there's a lot of silent prayers in the liturgy, Abuna is always praying in the liturgy, beginning to end, either out loud or either or silently. Um, and a lot of those silent prayers, they will end with words like, according to your mercy, Lord, or not according to our sins, for the sake of what? Anybody know? Your holy name. Your holy name, which is called upon us, that we are called by. You keep saying you are mine. I called you by my name. You are mine. And so we're calling, we're recalling on this. But we need to notice something very important here. It is not sufficient for a sick person to place himself or herself in the company of healthy people. Agreed? It's not sufficient. Or for a sinner to place himself or herself in the company of righteous people. It's great but it's not sufficient, right? It must be mingled with a desire to be better, to be healed. And then this desire needs to develop to become a will, an intention to be better and to be healed. And then this intention uh, or will needs to be translated into action, manifested as action. So simply placing myself in the right company won't do me much if I'm just sitting there and enjoying their good company. Um, and that's why it says in verse 5, another will write with his hand. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> in verse 5, it says another will write with his hand. Typically in the Bible, when you see the word hand or hands, it's a symbol of action, of word, of work. Sorry. Um, I immensely fear for those of us who think that they are well um, and righteous simply because they place themselves in the company of people who are well and righteous, but they're not laboring and working on themselves to become well and righteous. Just simply being in their presence, it's, it's good, it's wonderful. So just like bad company corrupts good habits or good morals hopefully good company will help corrupt the bad habits or morals but i need to do my part as well i need to work on it to desire to will and to work um all right let's go on to the next three verses very small and any comments or questions about the first five verses okay so somebody read first six seven and eight Okay, we'll read. Come on, thank you. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, 
the Lord of hosts. I am the first and I am the last. Beside me, there is no God. And who can proclaim as I do? Then let him declare it and set it in order for me. Since I appointed the ancient people and the things that are coming and shall come, let them show these to them. Do not fear nor be afraid. Have I not told you from, the, from that time and declared it? You are my witnesses. Is there a God besides me? Indeed, there is no other rock. I know not one. Thank you. In these three verses specifically, and that's why I wanted to like truncate it to just three, three verses, verses six, seven, and eight. God is declaring something very, very important. Can you tell what it is? And it's not a specific word that he said. It's like the sum of those three verses. What is God declaring here? He's only God. Yeah, more than that. You're right. Or I guess you can say it in a different way. I am the first and last. Okay. Beside me, there is no God. Okay, so you're putting them all together. I'm the first and the last. There is no other God. Beside me, there's no other God. Therefore, I'm the true God. Okay. He's sovereign. Uh, what does sovereign mean? Like he reigns over all. He's above everything. Yes, he's y'all are getting beyond straight. everything. So what he's saying is that he is sufficient. In him is everything we need. Everything a human being needs is in, in God. That's what he created us for. Okay. Why do you think God is starting this section again with thus says the Lord, the King of Israel? Based on everything we know about God from the book of Isaiah. Let's have some more interactions. Come on. Why do you think God is starting the section with thus says the Lord, the King of Israel? Or if you don't know, like maybe you can guess. In the previous section, he mentioned all the good things he promised to do to his people. And this section starts with thus means he expects, then I expect from you to be be sufficient with me because I already told you what I'm going to do for you. Yes. And yet, I, I totally agree. But he's also, again, God is reminding them yet again. This is how amazing God is. Like, we can't even picture him doing this, but he's doing it. He's reminding them again who they are to him. By him being their king, this means they are his subjects. He is responsible for their protection and their provision. And if anyone attacks them, they are attacking him. Remember Zechariah 2 8? He who touches you touches the apple of my eye. Yeah. So it's even more of the same. You are mine. I chose you. I called you by my name. I am your king. And because I am his servant, his subject, his slave, and he is my king, he redeems me. He purchases me back, like Sazram uh, Sis was saying, and his redeemer, the Lord of hosts. Um, right here, verse 6, his redeemer, the Lord of hosts. Um, and then he says, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there's no God. Our God and Lord, the Father and the Son, God the Father and God the Son, are obviously stating that he is God. God the Father is obviously stating, stating it here. And then God the Son uh, said, I and the Father, or the Father and I, are one. One. We're the same. Can I say something? We're the I'm same. Thing. Just a sec. We're the same thing. He said, the Father and I are one in the New Testament. And as we heard in the uh, sermon a couple of weeks ago, that he told uh, Mary and Martha, what are you talking about? I am the resurrection and the life. 
which is God, right? So you will find this in no other religion, by the way, because no one can claim it or um, can show evidence of it. And why does God keep telling them, besides me, there is no God? Besides me, there is no God? Why? Very simply, he's trying to convince them, prove to them with logic, so that they don't go to worship other gods and lose their salvation and their eternity. Um, go ahead, Mama. What did you want to say or ask? Sorry. You need to unmute, please. Am I unmuted? Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, go ahead. I can hear you now. Uh, number six, verse six, please, Abuna. Yes. Yeah, when he said, Thus say the Lord, the King of Israel, is reminding them that he is their only king. Because if you remember when they said to Samuel, We need a king. And God, Samuel was crying. He told him, they did not reject you. They rejected me. And this was one of the biggest mistakes they did, beside worshiping <clears throat> idols and other gods. Correct. He told them another, another human king will put taxes on you, will lay heavy burdens on you. But yeah, really, <laughs> we're doing ourselves the best favor by having him be our king. Mm -hmm. Then in verse 7, it says, and who can proclaim as I do? Then let him declare it and set it in order for me, since I appointed the ancient people and the things that are coming and shall come, let them show these to them. You know, something interesting, over the centuries, nothing ever that was worshipped as a god, as a small g god, Nothing ever claimed to be God. It was man who deemed it to be his God. Isn't this interesting? Idols, money, power, popularity, the stars, the planets, fire, whatever. None of those things claimed to be a God. Because they are all inanimate things, right? And even if they could speak, they will say, I am not God. If they could speak. This miracle actually happened um, in one of the saints. I don't remember who. There was some idol worshiping, and he made the, the idol speak the truth. And the idol told them, I'm not God. <clears throat> but he made the spirit that was in the idol. Uh, but many humans deemed them gods on their own volition. Only the one true God claimed to be God because he is indeed God. So let's, let's just remember this. The verse 8, it says, Do not fear nor be afraid. Have I not told you from that time and declared it? You are my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? <clears throat> Indeed, there is no other rock. I know not one. This is, by the way, the third time in these couple of chapters that God says to them the phrase, You are my witnesses. Not only should we be worshiping, not only should you be worshiping me, or worshiping God, but you should also be witnesses to me, to bring people to me, introducing me to others, and helping them to me so that they also may be saved. God wants us to worship him and to be witnesses to him, not just to worship him, to worship him so that we may be saved and to be witnesses to him so that others may be saved as well. This, this is loving God and loving neighbor. Loving God, worship him. Loving neighbor is to get them to worship him. And then I love that. He says, indeed, there's no other rock. A rock indicates strength, stability, and like existence and being. As we pray in the liturgy, oh, you, the being, the one who always is. And we read often about God and the faith in God being a rock. Can you think of any examples from the Bible? There's many. 
like um in the sound nice. sound sound yes. 18 yeah what does it say it says that you are my rock and my strength my rock and my strength mm -hmm. the rock of my salvation very good the rock of my salvation. Mm -hmm. yes when he told moses to hit the rock and the rock was christ as saint paul said okay and and then it gushed water to save the people yes also um and, uh, my god my rock in whom i hope that's another verse or uh the story of uh, nebuchadnezzar whoever falls on the rock will be broken to pieces and whomever the rock falls on will be crushed to powder also uh whoever hears my word and does them is like a man who built his house on a rock <laughs> And also, Abuna, the rock that uh, people uh, rejected, the cornerstone. The chief cornerstone, correct. Sorry. Also, um, when he told St. Peter, on this rock, I will build my church. Not on St. Peter, but on the rock that he is the Christ, the son of the living God. And then, yeah, we still have time. In the next passage... God begins to do something very interesting. He begins to do a comparison and uses simple, obvious logic to do a comparison between himself and the, the foolish idols that people deem as gods for themselves. Um, yani, I don't know how to put words on this, but it, it's really amazingly humble for our God to lower himself so much to allow himself to be compared to the idols for the sake of the salvation of his children. And he's the one who initiates that comparison. I think it's just an insult to compare God to idols, right? I think it's a huge blasphemous thing to do, but he's actually inviting this. He's initiating this just for the sake of convincing them, using logic to convince them in order to save them. How humble and how awesome our God is. It's amazing. Okay. This is a longer passage. So we're going to read now, unless if somebody has any comments on what we just read, six, seven, and eight. The very important three verses. We should go back and read them again. In him is all our sufficiency. There's no other God but him, the first and the last, and he's our rock. Um, now I need somebody to read from verse nine all the way through 20, because it's all like one... One passage, basically, God is comparing himself to the idols. Who will read? Huh? Yalla, quickly. I'll read. Thank you, Mary. Go ahead. Those who make an image, all of them are useless, and their precious things shall not profit. They are their own witnesses. They neither see nor know that they may be ashamed. Who would form a god or mold an image that profits him nothing? Surely all his companions would be ashamed. And the workmen, they are mere men. Let them all be gathered together. Let them stand up. Yet they shall fear. They shall be ashamed together. The blacksmith with the tongs works, on, works one in the coals, fashions it with hammers, and works it with the strength of his arms. Even so, he is hungry and his strength fails. He drinks no water and is faint. The craftsman stretches out his rule. He marks one out with chalk. He fashions it with a plane. He marks it out with the compass and makes it like the figure of a man, according to the beauty of a man, that it may remain in the house. He cuts down cedars for himself and takes the cypress and the oak. He secured it for himself among the trees of the forest. He plants a pine and the rain nourishes it. Listen to this coming stuff. Go ahead. Then it shall be for a man to burn, for he will take some of it and warn himself. Yes, he kindles it and, ba breaks and bakes bread. Indeed, he makes a god and worships it. He makes it a carved image and falls down to it. He burns half of it in the fire. With this half, he eats meat. He then roasts 
a roast and is satisfied. He even warms himself and says, ah, I am warm. I have seen the fire. And the rest of it, he makes into a god, his carved image. He falls down before it and worships it, prays to it and says, deliver me for you are my God. They do not know nor understand for he has shut their eyes so they cannot see and their hearts so they cannot understand. And no one considers in his heart, nor is their knowledge nor understanding to say, I have burned half of it in the fire. Yes, I have also baked bread on its coals. I've roasted meat and eaten it. And shall I make the rest of it an abomination? Shall I fall down before a block of wood? He feeds on ashes. A deceived heart has turned him aside. He cannot deliver his soul, nor say, is there not a lie in my right hand? Thank you. Um, all right. Um, let's see how much we can cover here. <clears throat> Verse 9, it says, those who make an image, all of them are useless, and their precious things shall not profit. They are their own witnesses. They neither see nor know, and and that they may be ashamed. You you see the logic here? He's saying they are their own witnesses. How? He's saying, how can you worship something that you created? Like you are a witness against yourself, or that another fellow human being created. Idol worshiping is a very absurd thing, like it makes no logic. Like now, many things can be their idols, right? But can you think of things that are idols? We mentioned already some of them. And with many of us, myself, and, and, and I forget all the times that I didn't know something or did something wrong, that, that I'm very limited. So with a lot of people, they forget all their weaknesses and they make themselves their own idol. Um, some people make another person their idol. They idolize them. Have you ever heard that word? Uh, it's not necessarily a good thing. Um, then we mention some other ones like money or um, beauty, uh, science. Some people actually have made that their idol or power or popularity or, or created things like animals and fish and stars and planets and fire and, and stuff like that. Every idol that you put in God's place in your life will sooner or later be to your shame, will cause you to be ashamed. I'll say that again. Every idol that you put in God's place in your life and treat as a God in your life will sooner or later lead to your shame and cause you to be ashamed. Verse 10. Who would form a God or mold an image that profits him nothing? Again, who would worship something that they formed? Um, <clears throat> okay. Um, do you know how, oops, what just happened? Sorry. My computer is. Maybe the people who love idols, idol crafts. I'm sorry, one second. Let me. I'm not sure what just happened. Sorry, y'all. Sometimes my computer overheats. Okay. Sorry, Eva, what were you saying? The people who love idols, um, I think they have a name because they create all these idols and they love them I like if you would be God but if that is wrong 
Yes. Yes. Do you know how the broad concept of idols came to be? Just the broad concept of idols, making something that I worship. I make something and I worship it. Can you think where that came to be? How it came to happen? Any they want to be independent. Okay, uh, mom, then Eva, then you know, Lizzie, I think, or Mary. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Who? Uh, Eva. Oh, I say, I think this is before Moses, like people were doing that. Yes, I agree. They have statues and monsters. Yes. Okay, mama. Yeah. They were proud of themselves. They were not accepting the real God. They were scared of him. Okay. So they started to make their own uh, desires. Yep. You're getting closer. Anyone else? This is a very broad concept of a Haaros came to be, but it is this. Simply that man didn't want a God who tells them what to do or how to live. That's it. Man wanted a God according to man's liking. That's what idol worshiping came from. In other words, by creating an idol, uh, man, in effect, is making himself the God. By creating an idol that I worship, I made it. So I'm, I'm, man is making himself the God. Basically repeating Adam and Eve's sin to be like God, knowing good and evil, as, as Satan tempted them. And Adam and Eve were repeating Satan's sin to be like God or to sit on the throne of God. So do you see how like it's, it's all under the same umbrella? And by the way, many of us treat God as an idol. Many of us treat God as an idol, to basically to be our servant, to do for us as we want. We approach him when we want him to do something for us. But for him to tell us what to do and how to live our life, and our attitude is, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think so. And, and they simply just ignore him and his commandments. I bet you, you know, people who, who live that way, who, who just do this. Um, verse 11 it's verse 11 is talking about how all of them will be ashamed it says surely all his companions would be ashamed and the workmen they are men let them all be gathered together let them stand up yet they shall fear they shall be ashamed together it's it, yeah, talking about how all of them will be ashamed. And I said, if we choose something other than God to be our small g God, it will lead to our shame. And then he begins to talk about how an idol is made, just from simple, tangible methods, okay? Um, to show them how useless it is and how pitifully foolish those who worship idols are. Those who make idols simply do it for another idol, which is money. Those who actually make the idols. Now, this is who make it a job. Remember the, the ones who, who, who made a big riot for uh, uh, the goddess Diana? It was the, the, the coppersmiths. Who, the people who were actually making is like, wait a minute, these Christians are going to put us out of uh, house and home, so we got to stop them. And they were just making the idols so to profit out of it. And then he begins to talk about those people. In verse 12, he says, the blacksmith with the tongs works one in the coals, puts it in the fire, gets it soft, and then he begins to beat on it with hammers. Kind of an idol of God is this. And then works it with the strength of his arm. With his strength of his arm, he forms this idol, this God. Even so, he's hungry and his strength fails. He drinks no water and is faint. So even the human being who is forming or making this idol, he himself is weak and needs to eat, and needs to drink, and needs to rest. Otherwise, he will faint. So, again, he's using simple logic. Somebody who is weak and can easily faint is making something that you're worshipping? Where's the logic here? 
okay? And actually, also sadly, when um, dealing with the idol, the human works uh, at it on and on and on and doesn't even stop to eat or drink and does it with such enthusiasm to the point where he doesn't eat or drink. But alas, when worshiping the one only true God, the human does, doesn't have any issue leaving the one true God and to go get rest or eat or drink. Um, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but a lot of times when we're, you know, I don't know, at a late night gathering with friends or when we're watching something uh, long on TV or when we're um, doing something like as a group and, and it can go for hours and hours until late hours of the night and we do it with such enthusiasm. But a lot of times when it comes to some time with God, even for minutes, we all of a sudden begin to feel aches and pains and we begin to yawn and we begin to get sleepy. Um, and we don't do it with enthusiasm. Part of it is us. Part of it is just the enemy trying to find us. How wonderful it would be if we worshipped God with the same enthusiasm that we have when dealing with otherworldly things. Um, I'm going to stop here uh, just because we're out of time. Let me put my marker. And uh, we'll, we'll do a quick uh, round table so that anybody who wants to um, share with us uh, um, something they've learned or, or uh, a question they have or um, anything. So we've covered through verse 12. Does anybody have any questions or comments or anything? Yes, Abona, can I add something about uh, man and his arrogance and his uh, proud and his really just dust? When man make the, the, the war and the weapons for the war and destroy other men, what's his benefit? He consider the war and the weapons and the money are these are all his gods because he doesn't think of God. If he thought of God, he will not make something to destroy the creation of God, right? I'm sorry, I didn't understand the, the, the question or the comment. The comment is that uh, the army, the weapon, the war is a kind of gods. Man doing it again is the people of God and all the people, all the world. Like the nuclear weapons, the people are very busy with these things and never think of God. Kind of okay, God. but but um, remember that we've had a lot of saints and martyrs in our church who were soldiers in armies, and they did go to war and battle. You know. Uh, representing their country. So not this all... This is different. This is so, different. Not, so not all soldiers or not all people in the military uh, or in wars are doing it as an idol worshipping thing. No, these are, are ordered to do their job, you know, which is okay when there is a defense. But the people who manufacture the weapons, and they are so consumed with it, they never think of God. Like the fight now about nuclear uh, weapons and uh, all these kind I mean, of some things. Though, who knows? I'm not going to get into that, Yanni, as to why people do it. I don't pretend to understand it. And some do it for political reasons, some do it for economical reasons, some do it for self defense to be ready in case somebody to or to, to keep others from attacking them and uh, Yanni. Uh, but yeah, those, the people, the leaders who are initiating those wars or who are doing those things, yeah, they have 
pretty much self as the idol. Are they interfere with other countries, Apuna, just to sell them weapons and to create the war, you know? Okay. I'm talking about the bad side of it, not the defense side. Okay. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Anyone else? All right, uh, then God willing, next time we will uh, resume uh, with uh, chapter 44 from verse uh, 13 uh, onward. Um, let's go ahead and pray. Anybody want to pray for us? Hmm? Okay, I'll in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Um, dear Heavenly Father, God, I, I, I don't understand how you operate. I don't understand how infinite your love is. I don't understand, actually, I, I really don't get the concept of unconditional love. Um, sometimes I'm so consumed by justice, and sometimes I just, I guess I don't have enough love in my heart. I'm like, I, I don't understand how these people can after everything, everything that you have done and keep doing for them, oh Lord, and everything you have done and keep doing for us, and these people keep betraying you, rejecting you, choosing other dumb handmade stuff to be their gods and insult you in such ways, and yet you keep pursuing, you keep reaching out, you keep encouraging, you keep telling them how much you love them, and it just doesn't make any sense to me, and I'm I'm just going to accept it. I'm not going to try to make sense of it. I'm just going to believe it that your love is amazing and um, infinite and and a person can just get lost in it diving swimming in it like all their life father help us to honor this love with all our heart as best as we can help us to pay this love forward as you asked us to do he said the one thing you've asked us to do is to just do this for others to love them like you love us Again, to the best of our very limited ability. Um, help us, Lord, to be aware of the idols in our life because we all have idols in our life. And if we stick with them or follow them or put our hope or reliance on them, they will for sure, as your word says, end up leading us to reproach and shame and disappointment and despair and misery. Help us, Lord, to see the goodness in worshiping you, the, the, the joy and the freedom and the strength and confidence in making, choosing you, our God, accepting you as our king. Be with everybody in this Bible study and help us to be true Christians and not just um, word knowers and to live out our Christianity in our everyday life. Lord, not just in church, but in our every day. We ask you to please hear us through the intercession set me. I know you see so modest who please you from the beginning of the mighty power of your life giving cross and the blessings of the days of the St. Mary's fast. Please, the Lord, make us ready to pray thankfully. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us as they are daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Christ Jesus, our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. I mean, and now the love of God, the Father, the grace is all begun. Son, our Lord, God, and Savior, Jesus Christ, the communion and the gift of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Go in peace. The peace of the Lord be with you. Thank you all so much, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Everyone. Thank Bye, you for everybody. your comments.